So what's on the agenda for today? I first want to talk a little bit about the example that I'm going to talk about uh, when, we watch, uh, when we watch the code samples later. Um, and then I would get, want to get everybody on the same page about what design ideas I wanted to incorporate. Um, then I'm going to explain to you why I chose Aka.net as an implementation to solve this problem. And then we'll dive into some code and I'm going to show you some things that you can do to make this work. And hopefully in less than an hour, I'll be able to wrap it up and uh, send you off on your next journey. So, what are we building? We are building beersender.net. Why are we building beersender.net? It was January this year. Uh, everything was on lockdown. We were all sitting inside again. We had a nice stint of like three conferences in November, December, and then the world went on lockdown because of Omicron again. I was really bummed out. I mean, I really like doing this, being on stage, getting lots of attention. I really hate doing it at home behind the webcam. So I was bummed out. I figured I'm gonna spread some cheer. So my idea came, I live in Belgium. And what do we do in Belgium better than any other country in the world is making beers, right? So I figured if I take some of those beers and I put them in a box, and I send them to my friends, everybody will be happy, right? That was my plan. It's a great plan, isn't it? So what I did is I went shopping for beer and I bought uh, eight cases of beer and spread them over eight boxes. They all had 24 different beers in them. So I had a very nice selection of mostly local beers. Um, so I packed them up in these nice boxes that a friend of mine uh, who runs a microbrewery uh, provided me. And I put shipping labels on them and I sent them on their way. So my expectation was that I would contact UPS and I would pay them like a handsome amount of money because these were heavy boxes, um, a handsome amount of money to deliver these boxes where they needed to be. So what I expected to happen is I, I dropped them off at the UPS shipping point and this would happen, right? All my friends happy. But that was not reality. Reality was like tracking pages that look like this. And if we zoom in, some of them got returned to me. Because as it turns out, I do not have a license to ship beer outside of the EU. That was something I did not encounter. So some of these boxes were going to Norway and Switzerland and the UK, so yeah. Um, so what actually happened was that I was tracking all these shipments and keeping track of which ones actually uh, got stuck in customs. I needed to provide extra content, um, extra info about what was in the boxes, like lots of emails going back and forth. And then without informing me of anything, the boxes showed up back at my help desk. So I'm trying to call UPS help desk, which is like a different layer of hell altogether uh, to figure out what had gone wrong. Um, but the packages, like half of the packages returned to me so I had to like get the shipping costs reimbursed and send them again. Then some of them were shipped correctly now, but there wasn't even a delivery attempt made. It's like, hey, Kevlin, did you, did you get that box? It's like, no, I was, I was here all day. I didn't even get a notice in my mailbox. Yeah, okay, but they're returning the box to me again. So I had to re-recuperate shipping costs and then send them again. And one of the boxes still hasn't arrived yet. So. Sending beer is tricky. I mean, making and filling boxes is a really, really fun activity if you want to, uh, to spread cheer, but shipping and keeping track of everything was really hard. So to do all that follow-up, we need beersender.net. So I figured I'm gonna build something for that. And why do we call it beersender.net? It was not built in VB6, so I append .net to the name as we have been doing for 18 years. Why do we still do that, like .net? Right? Um, but all the fun aside, um, what we're here to talk about is the des design ideas that I would use if I were to build such an application. So if we summarize DDD, and for me coming in contact with DDD was reading this book by Eric Evans, it's definitely one of the harder books that I've ever read. It was one of the only books that I wasn't able to finish in one go. And I've met a lot of people who weren't able to finish this in one go, so I don't feel inadequate. It's just a very dense book. Um, but if we summarize it for 
those of you who, have, who do not have as much experience in DDDs, the general idea is, is that we're going to try and align the business side of things and the code side of things. We want to use one language, a ubiquitous language, to describe business context. And if possible, we would like to convey that into our code and use the same context when we're writing that code. And in a high level, um, if you look at a high level system, you're going to have bounded context. A bounded context is like a certain domain where you can decide uh, where that language is applicable. Because a person might mean something completely different when you're shipping boxes uh, versus when you're filling them, right? When you're filling a box, you want to write a personal note to that person because he's your friend. When you're shipping boxes, you care where they live and what customs rules will apply if I try to get that box to them. So that bounded context is important. On a low level, we're going to try to make our code as expressive as possible. We're going to get, try to get as close to the business context as we can. And for that, we need to be able to separate certain blocks where we reason about certain things and where all the, um, all the events and all the commands and all the code come together. And that's what we call a root aggregate. Um, it's the root for reasoning about certain things. Now, the book itself is written from a more object-oriented way of doing things. Um, but if you start um, applying DDD, especially now today, we are more often driven towards uh, architectures like CQRS, concepts like event sourcing, um, and you using commands and events because they make reasoning about business context a lot easier. You can apply techniques such as event storming, where you try to describe the flow of things happening in your organization. So commands and events is an interesting one. Um, a command is something you can send into the system in imperative form. It is a request to perform a certain operation. We're going to write it imperative. Um, for instance, send beer. That would be a good command. An event is a, the, is a notification that something has happened in our system. It has already taken place. There's nothing you can do to change it. Um, but you can do something with that information. So those are written in the past tense. Um, for instance, beer received. If Kevlin finally gets his beer, then I will get that event. So CQRS architectures. Um, this has been around for a while. It's not necessarily linked to DDD, but it's a very nice match. Uh, what we're going to do with uh, CQRS is we're going to separate the command side of our application, the write side, where the data is changed from the side where the data is queried. Um, because it allows us to performance tune both sides uh, separately, and we have a very clear boundary, it's like a query cannot have side effects, right? It's something that in an object-oriented uh, context you might sin against. Um, so this architecture really enforces that, and it's very, very nice. Now, if we think about our domain-driven design, is, is we want to have a place where we send a command into the system, and that command is going to get handled. But a command can actually, it cannot fail. You cannot throw an exception and say like, okay, this command just didn't go through. What you can do is you can raise events to communicate the failure or to communicate the success, um, but the command itself cannot fail. The command is sent into the system and you as soon as it is accepted, it's going to be processed with certain results. And th those command handlers, they will talk to your truth database, where you are uh, able to see what the truth of the data at that moment is. And depending on the success, failure, whatever might happen, you're going to raise a bunch of events to communicate what has happened after you triggered that command. And those events, they will go on an event bus, um, and on the read side of things, you can subscribe to those events and use that to project your data to prepare it for read storage. And then you can, um, you can use your queries to just hit read, uh, the read database. Just in performance terms, what is really powerful about this is that if for every query you're going to define in your system, you could make sure that it hits a table on an index and it's going to be a single table select. 
performance will always be snap fast if you can achieve that. And this architecture allows you to do that really quickly. And then there's the last thing. Um, event sourcing is a concept that also can be applied in different contexts than DDD. Um, but it maps really well. Again, if you think about event sourcing, you can think about um, storing the state that your, that your data is in at a certain moment, but you lose the history of what happened to it. What caused this data to be in the shape that it is in today? For instance, a shopping cart is an example that is often used with this. Um, if you put product A into your shopping cart and then you see in the suggestions like you see product B and you think, oh, that might be better. I'm gonna put that in and throw A out again. Those are all events. You put A in, put B in, take A out. And there's a lot of valuable information in that, especially if you're building a recommendation engine for your shopping carts. Um, so the concept of event sourcing is instead of storing the state, we're just gonna store all the events that led to the state because if we replay the events, we can reconstruct the state. But we don't lose everything that led up to where we wanted to be at that moment. So if we try and batch all these concepts together, because I like all of them, um, that is what I wanted to do with my beer sender. So I wanted to do some kind of CQRS system where I have a separate query site and a separate uh, command site. I wanted to build my aggregates in a very clean way. I wanna make them, if possible, completely framework agnostic so that if ever I can plug them into something else. That's what we developers do, right? We over-optimize everything. I shouldn't do that, but. <laughs> but what I really wanna get at is I wanna have very nicely written tests, tests that even if I show them in code to my product owner, they can reason with me about those tests. That is one of the most important uh, things that we're trying to achieve. So when I talk about all these things, they say like, hey, Hamas, why didn't you use a CQRS framework? Why are you choosing an actor model? Well, there's a bunch of things that help us inside an actor model. So for those who don't know where ACA.net comes from, it is a straight up port from JVM ACA, um, which was written a couple of years before ACA.net started. Um, so since 2015, this is the official port. It was two projects that were combined. Um, Roger Johansson, who is now working on Proto Actor, and Aaron Stannard, who is running Petabridge, who support ACA.NET. Um, they were independently porting ACA to the .NET ecosystem, and they learned about each other's efforts. They joined forces, um, and ACA.NET came out. And they even got permission from Lightband, the company that was behind uh, JVM ACA to call it ACA.NET, and that's where we are. Now the ideas of doing actor models, they are not new. They are there since the 1970s. Um, they have been refined. Um, I don't know why most of the things that we're using today are around for such a long time, but they are. Um, probably because they got less distracted by their smartphone and social media in those times. Um, but their idea is we're gonna model our code after the way the world works. We are all objects, like these chairs in the rooms are objects, and things interact with each other. So can we not model our software in that way? That was their whole idea. And they, they used reactive patterns to do that, to build something that was highly concurrent. Now, multiprocessor PCs were not a thing at that time, um, multiple, systems uh, tied together in a network were. And the first time they brought this into practice was when Ericsson built the um, AXD301 telco system in uh, the 1980s. They invented a whole new programming language for that, which was Erlang. Um, and they managed to use the actor model to get an uptime on those telco systems in clusters of nine nines. So 99.979% uh, uptime. That's about 30, 31 milliseconds a year of downtime. Who gets that kind of uptime? I'd love to talk to you after this talk. Um, but yeah, I mean, very impressive. And that was the first application. But then we had like a couple of decades where nothing really happened with these actors. But then we had the explosion of the internet. We had IoT. We had 
um, app stores where certainly you could have an application that was featured and you would go from 200 to 2 million users over the course of a day. And so we need something that scales really well. And that's why in 2015, we got a lot of different actor models on the .NET ecosystem. We got um, Service Fabric Reliable Actors, uh, Project Orleans was released, which Microsoft used to build the backend for Halo. Um, and we got this. So that explosion caused all of this to be readopted and becoming more popular uh, now than it was a decade ago. So to do actors, um, the basic building block is, of course, the actor. And the way you reason about this in .NET code, it is a simple object that holds its own state, right? Because when you're writing, <coughs> when you're writing concurrent code, what is always going to hold you back is the fact that you're going to have, at some point, state that needs to be accessed from multiple threads. And that is always going to cause issues. You're going to implement locking, and locking is not nice. It might cause deadlocks, and so on. So to avoid all of that, what we do with actors is we only have a single thread running on an actor at any given time. And this is extremely powerful, because as an actor, you know that the fields that are internal to you, um, your own state, that you're going to be the only thread accessing that data when you're processing a message. And that is very, very powerful. There's no need for locking. There is no deadlocks occurring. There's also no waiting for any other threads to finish. Once you get a message dispatched to your internal behavior, the code that executes against that internal state, you can just run through it in a couple of milliseconds and be done with it. So those actors are the building blocks of our actor system. And that single threadedness, as I said, is really important. Now, what does that look like? We can inherit from the simplest actor class in the Aka.NET framework being untyped actor. And all we need to do is implement the onReceive method. That is what our messages will get dispatched into. If we want, we can check what type of message we have and we're good to go. Now those messages, um, they're even simpler. We don't need to implement anything, not even interface. Um, you can just have any .NET object as a message. Only thing is, it needs to, you need to be able to serialize it, so all the public fields need to be accessible. You can perfectly, like, .NET record types are perfect for messages. I mean, you're immutable by default. Um, but it's best to design or at least treat your messages as immutable. Um, Aka.NET doesn't enforce um, the immutability on messages, so you might change the content of a message while an actor is processing it. And if your message didn't cross a machine library, that, uh, a machine boundary, that would be possible. But um, just don't do that. You're going to have a bad time. The throughput that the lightband people claim on Aka.NET is about 50 million messages per second on the server. Um, after the latest update of both .NET and ACA.NET, I get 4 million on my laptop, and that's a five-year-old laptop. So I have no reason to doubt those numbers. Um, on a beefy server, that is definitely going to be possible. But to do all the orchestration, like the hard part, right? We have those inboxes that need to be managed. managed. We need a thread pool that those messages get dispatched to certain actor in, uh, instances on. We want to manage our memory because every actor is going to take up some memory. So the actor system is actually going to instantiate actors for us and spin them down again and maybe re-instantiate them if we need them. All stuff like that is managed by the big puppet master, which is the actor system. Coincidentally, this is the first Metallica CD I bought when I was young. So that should date me somewhere, right? Um, but the actor system does all that heavy lifting for us, and luckily we don't need to do a lot of work. So making an actor system is as simple as instantiating it with the factory method and giving it a name. Now, as I said, the actor system is responsible for creating our actor instances. We never have a reference to that actor in hand. We're only going to get um, a reference to our actor. And what we need to do that, to tell the actor system to create our actor in the correct way, is we have something called props. And props 
um, can be adequately described as being a constructor pointer. You're going to point at the constructor of your actor class and you're going to tell it which parameters um, to use. In this case, I'm using the default constructor. I didn't pass any par um, parameters, but this just takes a params array and you can pass whatever needs to go into your constructor in this props method. And that tells the actor system how to create your actor. If you want to create a root actor, what you do is you do system.actor off, you give your actor a name, you pass in the props, and then your actor system knows what to do. And what you get back is an iActor ref. The iActor ref is a very, very powerful thing. It is a small object that allows you to talk to that actor instance. Now, if for some reason the actor system has um, spin your actor down and needs to recreate it, you can still use that actor ref. And if you talk to it, the message goes into the inbox, the actor system will spin your actor back up again and the message will go through. So this is a decoupling between talking to an actor and the actual implementations and the actual objects in memory. And if you want to send a message to an actor, you can simply use the mes message tell, you pass in your message and you're good to go. Simple, right? Now, as I said, we what we did now is we created a top-level actor. Um, but actors live in a hierarchy. You have the three blue ones at the top. They're always there. The root actor, the user, and the system actor. And underneath the system actor, we have a whole bunch of actors that do things like the event bu bus, the, uh, the inbox management, the threat scheduling, all that sort of stuff. You usually don't touch that. Under the user actor is where you create yours. So if you do system.actor off, you're creating a top-level actor, probably the A1 or the A2 in this drawing. And your address is defined by your position in that hierarchy. So the one at the bottom right is called slash user slash A2 slash B3. Now this is important because this has two implications. One, if you are the child of a certain actor, your name needs to be unique. You cannot have three B3s under A2. You can have a B3 under A1, but you cannot have three B3s under A2. So at some point you're going to be putting ID, IDs in actor names. Um, another thing is that this hierarchy becomes important when we're going towards that um, error handling that I'm going to talk to about in the next slide. Now how do you create children? Instead of doing system.actorof, we have, um, oh, I'm going to go back and describe that in a second. Instead of um, system.actorof, you do context.actorof. So when you're processing a message on an actor, um, you have something that is the context, is the execution context. It will tell you stuff about where is this message, message coming from, where is it going, um, which actor am I, stuff like that. And if you do context.actorof, what you're doing is you're creating a child, right? Now what you see here is we don't have an untyped actor. I have a receive actor. And for you who are working as .NET developer, this will feel so much more familiar um, compared to the untyped actor. This is the typed version. And instead of having this generic unreceive that takes in an object, you get to register your, um, your message handlers. So you can just do a receive for every type of message that this actor is expecting and you can re register which method is going to handle it when it comes in. This feels a lot more familiar for the net developers, right? So use these, they're better. Um, but when I said, like error handling, um, any of you have children? I do, I have three. Um, yeah, you can feel pity for me. Um, if you take your kids into a supermarket, who is responsible? Is it your kids? Yes? Oh, that's hopeful. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about parenting later. Uh, <laughs> um, so are your kids responsible when they knock something over, when they run their shopping cart into uh, an old lady's ankles, whatever? No, you're going to be the one apologizing. You're going to be the one fixing their mistakes. And it is no different in an actor system. If a child actor throws an unhandled exception, that exception is escalated to the parent, and the parent can decide how to handle this. Um, some actions aren't, uh, some exceptions aren't that bad, so you can tell the actor to resume. It's like, okay, this wasn't that bad, just pick up the next message from your inbox and you can continue. 
sometimes it's really bad. When you see a kid like painting its bedroom wall, you're gonna shout stop. It's like stop whatever you're doing, right? Um, that terminates the actor. Don't do that to your kids, okay? Don't terminate your kids. Um, but you're gonna tell the actor to stop, you're gonna delete the instance, you're gonna delete the inbox, like you're done. Um, restart is a little bit more friendly. It is like, okay, go ahead, try again. You failed this time, but it might be that you succeed next time. And the cool thing about restart is it actually uh, deletes your actor instance, recreates it with the same props that it was originally created with, and then it dispatches the same message again. And the, in the inbox is preserved. So if you have some kind of transient exception that you might recover from, restart is a very nice thing that you could try. Or if you don't know what to do anymore, it's like when your kids are really misbehaving, it's like, I'm gonna ask my dad how he dealt with me when I was that age. So you can escalate the, um, ex uh, you can escalate the exception to the grandparent as well, right? And you can do this for one failing actor or for all your children. Um, this makes sense in a context. This is a pattern that you see a lot when you're dealing with actors, is if you have a huge workload, what you can do is you can cut it up into small pieces and then dispatch all those pieces to different child actors so that they can all execute in parallel. But if one exception would invalidate the entire workload, you don't want all the other child actors to continue processing. So you're gonna want to stop them all. So you want your supervision strategy to apply to all the child actors. Now this is a bit abstract. How you do that in code is you implement the, uh, you override the supervisor strategy method. And you're gonna return something, um, one for one means I'm gonna apply this only to the failing child. And depending on what exception you get in, you, can, uh, you have this um, selector method that you can use to figure out what directive you wanna give back. Um, so if you have something fatal, you're gonna want to maybe stop that child. If it's transient, you're, you could restart. And if you don't know what to do anymore, you can escalate, right? So this is how that works. You just implement that one method and you, uh, you pass it back uh, in the supervisor strategy method, and that will apply to any failing child exceptions. Now this is, this is, the, the, this is what made it possible for them to get down to those milliseconds per year downtimes, right? Everything that fails needs to be caught somewhere and handled appropriately. And then there is a last thing. I've been talking about objects that hold their own internal state um, and how those objects get recreated by the actor system. And as you might guess correctly, that would mean that all state is lost, right? At some point, there's some actors where you're actually going to care about the state that's in them. You're gonna want to persist that somewhere in a database so that when the actor is recreated, you can actually recover. Um, to do that, we can use the ACA persistence library. And the ACA persistence library is very, very powerful. You need to uh, give your actor a unique persistence ID. That is what it's going to use to uh, store everything into the data store that you choose. Um, it supports like a whole bunch of things. You can put it in Azure table storage or in a SQL database or in MongoDB, whatever. Um, you're gonna have to give it a persistence ID and now you have different methods. You don't, no longer have a receive method, but you're gonna have recover and command um, instead. Now how this works is inside your actor, you can snapshot your own state and save that to a database if you want. Um, and when the actor is recreated, what it will do is it will get that snapshot from the, uh, the snapshot storage, and then it will get all the events that have happened since that snapshot and replay those, and then it will start accepting messages from the inbox. And if you have paid attention to my introduction, this maps pretty closely to what event sourcing is, right? So this is built-in event sourcing. Now this is, this is a pretty long actor. I think it's spread across three slides. Um, so what we're looking at, we're now using persistent actors. You only get those when you install the persistence package. Um, so you need to give it that persistence ID, which is just a, which is just a string. Um, and what I usually do is I group all of my state into a single state object. It makes reasoning about it a lot easier, right? When you're snapshotting and recovering snapshots, that becomes a lot easier to handle, but you don't have to do that. It's just me who does that. Um, 
And as I said, you no longer have a receive method, you now have a command and a recover. And what's the difference between those? Command comes from the inbox and recover comes from your event store. And why would you want to treat those two differently? You want to treat them differently because an incoming command might actually want to save that to the event store. But when you're recovering, you don't want to resave that again, right? Um, so that's why they come in in a different way. And then we can do a whole bunch of things with snapshots. Um, the reason that there are so many snapshots methods is because um, saving a snapshot is something that happens out of thread. So when you're, queue, when you're uh, calling these save snapshots inside a persistent actor, it spawns a different thread that will save that to disk for you. It's not gonna happen in sync. So that's why you can subscribe to certain events that come back to see if that saving was successful or was a failure. Um, now, how do we persist messages? Um, there is a persist method that takes the message that you want to write inside, um, that you want to write to your event store. And then you call a certain method that will mutate your state. And then Aka.net knows what to do because all of these go onto a stack and they are all processed when the, uh, the thread is done. So this persist method is important. Um, that is how you make sure that it gets persisted. Um, and we just add that in our state. That internal, that handle message internal is the one that we are gonna call on a recovery. It's also the one that will actually do all the mutating for us. Um, so it makes sense to, for instance, keep track of um, how many messages were since your last snapshot. You might want to do that in the internal one. That, that way your counter is recreated even on a recovery. Snapshotting is in your own hands. You can just call save snapshot whenever you want. You don't have to. So if you figure that we are building actors that will never get more than 100 messages in their lifetime, why would you want to save snapshots? Just save all the events, replay them, it'll be faster. And when you get a snapshot back when you're recovering, when the actor restarts, it looks like that. You get a snapshot offer a message and inside the offer is an object that is your state. If you grouped everything in a state object like me, this is all the code you need. So this is why this is handy. Otherwise you're recreating a whole bunch of uh, different fields. And you can subscribe to those two messages if you want, didn't do anything with it here. Um, but sometimes it might be important to know if a certain snapshot um, <coughs> succeed, succeeded or failed. So as you could have guessed from this description, um, both DDD and actors have a philosophy that they're modeling the code after the real world. In DDD, we're trying to bring the business and, and the code together. In actors, we are bringing like the objects as close to the way objects work in the real world. Both map very well with message-driven ap uh, approaches. The event source persistence is built in. We even have an event bus, and as a benefit, it's very high throughput. There is cluster support and so on. So it felt like a good match. So how do we bring all of these into practice for our beer sender? Now, as a disclaimer, none of this is production ready code. I oversimplified some things. What I wanna show you is which features of Aka.net might come in handy when you're building something like this. Um, it's all about what's possible and what you can do. So when we're talking about aggregates, um, I said that I wanted to build my aggregates, if at all possible, in a framework agnostic way um, so that they don't know anything about the storage and that I can write really nice and clean tests for them. So you don't have to define an interface. I just did to make it clear in this talk. What I want to do is I want to have two methods on my ag aggregate. And the first is like, I want to check what would happen if I would execute a certain command. Um, and that will give me a bunch of events back, right? I could have chosen to make this already mutate the internal state of the aggregate for reasons that we will see later, I did not. So this just checks like, if you would execute this command right now, what, which events would I get? And then I have the apply event method, which is actually the thing that will apply that event to a certain state. It's all a recovery thing, it all pieces together in a second. 
So, my root aggregate is a single shipment of beer. I'm gonna send a box to Rene over there, right? Which I did. Um, so I'm gonna send a single box of beer. Um, so some of the fields that I care about are my shipment ID. Uh, I wanna see if there's already beers in it. Um, all the states are just fields, nothing more, nothing less. And because we, we will serialize this entire aggregate as a snapshot, we are already done for persistence uh, with this part. Now, my check command is actually going to do something. Um, do I have highlights in this slide? No, I don't. Um, the check command method is going to take certain commands in and see what would happen. And then you'll get method methods like the one in the bottom. If I get the send beers command, I want to check if there's already beers in the box and that I attach the shipping label to it, because otherwise nothing is going to get sent. And there's nothing else to do for those handle command um, methods to raise a certain number of events, beer send or the beer send fails. Um, if we're thinking about applying events, we're gonna get certain events in, and we are going to apply them into the internal state of our aggregate. And usually that doesn't mean anything else like a method at the bottom. If a shipment is created, if that event is applied to this aggregate, and because it is applied to this aggregate, we know that it was already checked, right? Because that happened in the check command method. So we don't have to worry about all the conditions. We can just apply the event to our state. The conditions are checked in the check command. If we want to write very expressive tests around that, I made an, a base aggregate test class um, that takes in our aggregate. And I implemented things for a given when and then, which is a very, um, a very commonly used pattern of writing tests. Um, the given is just a bunch of events. The given is these events have already taken place. And then I'm gonna try and raise a command. So my when is going to take a command and it's going to dispatch that command to my aggregate. And then on the expect from that command, I'm expecting to get a bunch of events back, right? And this, message, uh, this method is just gonna match that against the list that my um, aggregate actually raised after that command. So what we would get is a test that my product owner would probably understand. If I create a, a new shipment with a certain shipment ID, and I add a Gauden Carolus quadruple whiskey infused to it, which means that my box now has beer in it, and I add a shipping label with track me one to three, if I would try to send that box, I expect that the beers are sent. If you can have this type of tests about your pretty low level code, you're gonna bridge the gap with those people. And you can even write those tests together with product owners. And I think that's a very, very powerful thing. And I think that's a lot of what DDD is about. It's like bridging that gap. But now we have an aggregate that is agnostic. It has nothing to do with actors yet, right? So we're gonna need to wrap that aggregate inside, inside an actor. And I chose to do it with a generic implementation that would apply to all actors that implement that interface. And I chose for that actor to also handle the persistence, um, which is quite powerful. So we did the receive persistent actor, and I chose as a persistent ID the type of actor and the ID of the actor. That is an easy thing to do. And I'm just gonna do, uh, subscribe to events. There's also subscribing to commands just below it. Um, but there is a difference between the apply event that comes from recovery and the one that comes from uh, my inbox. Um, and that is the difference is that we're gonna need to persist it if it comes from the inbox. Now, in the snapshot, we just replace our aggregate because we saved that with, um, with all of its fields into the database. And if we get new events, and this is that apply event, persistence has already happened if it needed to happen, all we're going to do is dispatch that event to our aggregate. 
we don't need to do anything else. And then underneath, you can see, oh, you can see that we implemented that same 100 messages I'm gonna snapshot, but you can do whatever. Um, if you want actors to save a snapshot every one hour, there are mechanisms that allow you to schedule messages to your own actor. Um, all of that is possible. And then the last thing is like when a new command comes in, I'm gonna check it against the aggregate and all of the events that are, com that are going to come out, I'm gonna persist those. And this is why I wrote that interface the way that I wrote it is because we are applying the state now in the persist method together with the event that has happened, I now have a nice and clean event stream for my actor when it comes back from persistence. One more thing that we do here, um, so we're doing the check command and we're, we're persisting them all. One, thing you, one line you see here is the event stream. I'm gonna come back to that in a couple of slides. So when we make new aggregate actors, all we need to do is implement it with the right uh, aggregate type and you're already done. Now, let's talk about how we're going to build an entire actor system around these aggregate actors, because we can now spawn a bunch of these, um, but there's a little bit more to do. So the way that I think this should look is we have a command router on the left, which is an actor that is going to re be responsible for all the commands that come in on that command side of our CQRS system. That actor is going to talk to the aggregate manager, which is right next to it, and that actor has only one responsibility. It's like if an actor doesn't exist yet, it's going to create it as a child and it's gonna pass the I actor ref back to the command router so that the command router can send its command to that specific aggregate. Now, for reasons, we're gonna also want to have our um, read storage separate from that. So we're gonna have a bunch of actors that are projecting the event stream into our read storage, right? So for every type of event that we want to deal with in our read storage, we're gonna make a projector. I'll come back to those in a minute as well. And then you might want to fold certain events back into your aggregates. So some aggregates might respond to, uh, respond to events that were not created by themselves. Uh, and for that, you can also subscribe to the event stream. It's a very similar mechanism and you can use fold uh, actors for that. So that was all that. So the aggregate manager, it um, takes a connect request and there's a couple of things that are very handy inside Aconet.net. You have, for instance, a sender that is being uh, set when, um, when, you're dis uh, when you're processing a message from your inbox. It's a property that is being set on your actor. You can assume that that was the actor that actually sent you the message that you're dealing with at the moment. So when you do sender.tell, what you're doing is basically replying to the actor that sent you that message. So if you have that uh, aggregate manager, what it could do is like, okay, if I don't have this child yet, I'm going to create it and send the I actor ref back. And it will create one aggregate per um, instance. Now the command router is something different. Um, it will just cache all the actor refs that it has from all the aggregates. If commands come in, it will talk to them. Um, pretty simple, it will just relay messages. Um, the problem with this actor is that it may become a bottleneck. Because as you might have, uh, may have uh, already assumed, if you have an actor that gets more messages than a single thread on your CPU can process, your inbox is going to keep growing indefinitely. And that is going to hurt you because that actor is going to become like a point of failure in your system. Inbox overflow is a thing that might happen. And those projectors we are going to create at the start of our system, because if we want to subscribe to the event stream for certain types of events that happened because they need to mutate our read storage, um, the actors need to be there, otherwise the messages will not get dispatched. So those are um, the projector creator will actually create all the projectors for us so that they can subscribe themselves to the event bus and things can happen. And the faults is very similar. Um, I have to watch the time a little bit. Um, it's very similar. They will subscribe themselves upon system startup and they will basically relay 
certain events to certain aggregates. Now the event bus. The event bus is something that is built in um, into ACA.net. It is even on a cluster level. So if you have multiple actor systems working together as a cluster, the event bus is a cluster uh, site affair. Publishing is really easy. You just do uh, the context, is the message processing context that we talked about earlier. You can do context.system.eventstream and then publish whatever message you want to put on the bus. Um, you can, put, you can do this from an actor. You can also do it from outside the actor system. If you have a reference to the actor system, you can access the event stream as well. If you want to subscribe an, uh, an actor to uh, that event stream, we can call that uh, subscribe method. And when we do the subscribe, we can pass a certain actor um, and we can tell it which type of message we're interested in. And mind you, there is no filter. So you cannot say I'm interested in these type of messages for that aggregate ID. That's a possibility that this event bus doesn't have. So that's why I decided that I needed one projector for each message type, and that is going to um, handle all of the messages that come into that. Now, the pre-start method, I didn't talk about that yet. That's a method that gets called on the actor before it starts accepting messages from the inbox. Um, so when you instantiate a new actor and it needs to do things before it actually uh, starts accepting messages, the pre-start method is what you would want to use, such as subscribing yourself to the event bus. Now that command router that I talked about, that might be a bottleneck, right? Um, and cool thing, they already solved that for us. Um, Inbox overflow is, is a potential problem for an actor, and you can solve that using routers. Um, in ACA.NET, you can treat a pool or a group of actors uh, as one, and they will get a single address, and you can basically decide to distribute the inbox messages across those actors, so that you basically have a multi-threaded processor for one inbox. Um, and you can use different routing strategies. You can do round robins, like one for each, and then start at the beginning again when you're at the end. Um, you can also look at the inboxes of all your um, actors in your pool and decide to send it to the one that has the smallest inbox. Or you can do consistent hashing, and that might also be interesting in an aggregate context. Consistent hashing is where you're going to inspect your message and decide based on the properties of that message uh, which hash that message will get. And if you would use your aggregate ID as a hash, that means that all the messages for that same aggregate ID would go to the same actor in your routing pool. It might be something you don't want, or it might be something you want, but it's something you can use. And configuring routers is actually not that hard. You do it um, when you create your props. And you tell it, instead of just creating one, I want you to have a router with a round robin pool with five instances. And what this will do is this will create five command routers for us and just round robin to them. We don't need to do anything else. We can still talk to that one I extra ref that we get back and all those messages will get distributed. So if you have bottleneck actors, there are solutions. This is something you might want to apply to maybe your projectors or your fault uh, your faults as well if those are becoming a problem. So this can be solved. We're 10 minutes out, uh, which means that I want to leave a little bit of room for questions. Um, so if we summarize what we saw today, we're going to wrap aggregates and actors. We're going to wrap our projectors, projectors and actors. Our commands are messages, our events are messages, and the event sourcing is built in. So our conclusion is that domain-driven design and actors really match really well. There is um, not a lot of friction between the two concepts. You can very easily build a CQRS system without needing a framework. Um, and that, in my opinion, makes it really nice to mix those two. Now, there's a whole bunch of things that we did not talk about today. There's like a whole bunch of things that you can um, expand further upon this. For instance, you might want uh, to expose your event stream or part of your event stream back to your UI. 
So maybe you will have an actor that publishes messages from the event stream to a SignalR hub so that your UI can subscribe to some of those messages. Um, if you're configuring actor systems, and that's a whole, a whole different hornet's nest, um, you're going to have to use Hogan configuration. And Hogan st stands for Human Optimized Configuration Object Notation. It's something that looks like JSON, but isn't really JSON. It's like exactly what we need, right? Another configuration language. Um, it's not really that hard, uh, but it's something that allows you to um, bring some of the stuff um, that you normally do in code to the outside. For instance, um, you could configure that pool size for that router actor. You could configure that in Hocon so that you don't need to rebuild your application if you want to change the number of, um, of, router, uh, of routes in that, in that pool. Clustering is also something we didn't talk about in depth, but know that you can um, have actor systems work together as a big cluster. You can have nodes that have certain roles. Um, you can have you can shard your actors across a bunch of nodes uh, and talk to them without knowing where they are. Um, all that sort of stuff is really powerful. And what is cool to know is that if an I actor ref passes a machine boundary or goes outside of your actor system, it has something called location transparency. And location transparency means you don't have to care on which node that actor is. If you have the actor if, you can talk to it. And that is, that is pretty cool. Logging is something that we also didn't talk about, but there are adapters for pretty much any logging or observability framework that you would care about. Um, so explore the packages, uh, dive into that. And the last thing is that the only paid tool that the people from Petabridge offer, uh, because ACA.net is free, it's open source, uh, but there is a production monitoring system, costs about 4,000 euros a year. Um, what that allows you to do is monitor how many actor, system, uh, actor instances are in memory at the moment, how big the inboxes are, uh, what your average time to processing is, and so on. You get a whole bunch of metrics for monitoring a huge actor system in production. If you're serious about this, like look into that. It's going to help you a lot. If you want to learn more, there is a very cool uh, free bootcamp on, um, on GitHub. It is maintained by the um, Petabridge people. It'll walk you through all of the basic con uh, um, concepts of building actor systems. Their blog is amazing. Every new feature that they put out, they blog about extensively. Um, which means that you can find a lot of the stuff that you want to know over there uh, without looking for it. They have paid training as well. The training is really good. It is given by the people who actually built all this. Um, so that is very valuable. My name is Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development for a company called Access in Belgium. That is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I'm trying to make ICQ great again. Um, yeah. I've been doing this for four years. Nobody ever messaged me on ICQ. So let today be the first. Um, do any of you have questions? Oh, I have to go back. They do have an app, though, on iOS and on, uh, on Android. So the trouble for me was reviving that ICQ number, which meant that I needed to reactivate my Hotmail account. So, <laughs> so any questions? Yes. Yes. Right. Good question. Um, we have a bunch of actor systems, right? Um, they all do their own things um, better and their own things uh, worse than the others. Uh, for instance, uh, in the beginning, Orleans was really built towards that real-time com communication because it was meant to be the backend for Halo, whereas um, Aqua.net was a really nice middle ground. Um, and Service Fabric reliable actors were very enterprisey, but I would argue that they weren't real actors. If you would disp uh, dispatch a message to a downstream actor, the threat in the main actor was paused. So getting like real performance out of that wasn't really possible, but it made for very robust processes. Um, Proto actor works a little bit um, different from Aqua.net, whereas like 
clustering and where your actors go is not something you worry about so much in Proto Actor as you would in Aka.net. Um, I'm just most familiar with Aka, um, which is I chose this as an example, but I'm guessing that you can probably do DDD and CQRS in, in any of them. Um, so yeah, for this case, no real reason. Um, for me, it felt like the, when I got into actors, it was the, the best middle ground that I found for the cases that we were working with at that time, which was an IoT solution. Was that too honest? <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, the message queuing system. It's, it's actually has its own uh, built-in uh, message queuing system. So if you want to uh, connect to an outside message queue, that would completely be possible. Um, maybe publish them to the event stream or dispatch them to uh, to the messages. But like the, the message queuing is built in. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Yes. Well, it, it has at most one's delivery. It gets very close to one. Um, when you have memory pressure, what the actor system will do is it will spin down actors, like try and free up the RAM from those actors because it will remember the um, uh, props that they were created with and it can recreate them. But at some point you might run out, yes. Um, and then you're going to lose them and then you get at most once delivery. Oh yeah, if you turn the machine off, yes, everything is gone. So if you do, yeah, that's something I also didn't touch on on this slide. I touched on it on, in my uh, IoT uh, slide deck. Is if you want to redeploy your system, what you're going to need to do is pause all the input, make sure that all the actors get done processing, and then turn it off and redeploy. But yes, you will lose messages when you uh, recycle your, your actor systems. No, not really. It's still very close. Uh, the people at Lightband are building a lot of products on top of uh, the JVM Aka, things that we don't have in the D, uh, .NET ecosystem yet. So there's a couple of products that they're making that, we, that Aka.NET doesn't have answers to, but the original implementation is really close to um, what JVM Aka is. Yes. Persistence happens on an actor level. So everything that has been persisted, that is not lost. What was in the inboxes, that's in memory. Yeah. No, no. Like the, the memory overhead for an actor in a release build is about 400 bytes. That is if you don't have any state in it, right? You just create something that inherits from an untyped actor. 400 bytes. So you can easily have millions of actors on a single machine. That is not going to be an issue. So a lot is like hundreds of millions. Then you might consider a cluster. Um, but like a couple million actors, it's not going to be a big deal. OK. If you want to talk more, hit me up in the hallway. I'll be here until Friday. For those of you who still are in town on Friday, we're going to do PubConf. There are a couple of tickets left. It's going to be really fun. Um, there'll be funny talks and us embarrassing ourselves. Um, the ticket includes food and beer, so feel free to sign up and join us on Friday in the Barley Mo. Have a nice last two talks of your conference, and I hope to see you later.